discuss the data from the German CLL 11 study on obinutuzumab, where uh, basically uh, that led to the approval of obinutuzumab and chlorambucil for uh, upfront treatment of CLL in uh, patients. I'll have actually, show. why don't you start us out with that? Yeah, sure. So the German CLI-11 study is uh, focusing on patients who are unfit, which is defined by the Sears criteria, uh, Sears score of uh, greater than six, or the, if they have reduced creatinine clearance of less than 70. So among these patients, this is a randomized study with three arms. Basically, they're trying to compare the chemotherapy along with chlorambucil versus immunochemotherapy with uh, chlorambucil plus rituximab uh, chlorambucil versus obinutuzumab, which is a, a second generation uh, anti-CD20 antibody. So the results of the study shows uh, two important things. One is that the immunochemotherapies in both arms are better than chlorambucil in, both, in terms of the response rate, progression-free survival, and overall survival. When you're comparing the uh, obinutuzumab arm plus chlorambucil versus rituximab plus chlorambucil, there's uh, actually improved progression-free survival with obinutuzumab, but there's no overall survival benefit. Um, so based on this, and there's also another uh, striking thing is that with the obinutuzumab combination, you're achieving a much higher rate of uh, complete response and also a MRD negative complete response. So you, you do tend to get a deeper remission with obinutuzumab compared to the rituximab combination. And we know that at least from the prior um, immunochemotherapies, for example, the CLL8, uh, FCR versus FC study, uh, the deeper the response there is, the, it se seems to translate into a longer progression-free survival. Um, so this is something that I think it would be interesting to see if it translates into this type of immunochemo combination as well. I think the only issues I would make up is that people have not used obinutuzumab have to recognize that there is significant infusional uh, toxicity with the first dose, and that has to be an issue. People have to be prepared for it. They have to actually make sure they pre-med the patient with steroids, but also understand that, uh, be prepared for it, not to be scared of it, but to be prepared for it. And also, I was wondering from the panel, I mean, it's for the unfit LDCL. Is anybody starting to incorporate um, say uh, that uh, regimen into say younger patients for any reason or has anybody seen uh, getting uh, people from the community yet getting that combination say that are not elderly? Any comment? So I've not seen any uptake in the use of abinutuzumab chlorambucil in the younger fit patients. I mean I okay. think it's a you know it's an interesting idea when you talk about the potential of of using what might be less toxic chemotherapy or less toxic regimen but we are still confronted with the fact that the PFS is far lower for that combination compared to uh, the other chemoimmunotherapy combination. So I think that it's a, you know, remember that the, the important endpoint is going to be, you know, how long this patient's well and with us. And, you know, right now we don't know how best to achieve that except by using the data that we have. Yeah, we're seeing it though, and uh, of course the regimen of the obinutuzumab and chlorambucil or ofatumumab and chlorambucil have been approved yeah. uh, even for younger patients, and we're seeing a few of that. I think there's a uh, proclivity to use bendamustine and obinutuzumab, and we're seeing some of that as well. I know that there was a study that we uh, were able to participate in, and overall response rate of 90% and, and CR rates that were approaching FCR standards. So I think more data needs to come out with regard to the use of bendamustine with obinutuzumab in those particular patients. And I think Dr. Furman is absolutely right. We have to understand what the responses are and try to figure out whether it is indeed something that can substitute for FCR. I was just going to say, but the, you know, bendamustine and obinutuzumab uh, have not been uh, FDA approved the, uh, that combination. So I'm seeing, I don't know if the other the panel members are that uh, there's actually a pushback from a number of the um, payers that if you try to use an agent which is more expensive than, say, rituximab, that a lot of times we have to ask for off-label use and it won't be approved. So I don't know what the benefit of using it before we actually get the data published on these trials. Well, yeah, the data was actually presented last year's ASH meeting, and yes. the paper is actually uh, going to be coming out soon. I think the combination of bendamustine and obinutuzumab, uh, the results were really, truly, uh, uh, actually very good. Yeah. So I think based on that, there may be uh, some justification for using it uh, in combination. 
And I think unlike a lot of new drugs that are, you know, that are priced um, quite expensively, when you look at the German, when you look at the German CLL study, the two arms, you know, rituximab, the rituximab plus chlorambicil versus obinutuzumab plus chlorambicil, there was almost a year of progression-free survival extension with, uh, you know, with obinutuzumab, same chemotherapy. So to me, that suggests, in that comparison, with that combination, it's a better antibody. When you look at the cost at our institution, it represents three thousand dollars more than what rituximab costs. And so, you know, on a cost-benefit ratio, being in remission for you know for an extra year, I think justifies three thousand is justified by three thousand dollars extra costs. I guess my You're, concern, John, is that you may not see the same synergy or degree of synergy with other agents other than chlorambucil. Maybe we've just heard benamustine, but I don't think we can extrapolate that everything is better with abinutuzumab than rituximab. I I I, I say I you know, I agree. But in the context, you know, you know, in the context of trying to, you know, to understand which which antibody is better, because we have three of them, and we've not talked about ofatumumab, which with Quambasol had, uh, you know, a similar progression-free survival right. compared, you know, say as you know was seen in the obinutuzumab you know, Quambasol study. So you know, we really until comparative studies of the different antibodies are done, you know, all together, we probably won't know. One one of the points one of the points um, that I wanted to touch on, you know, that I think doctors as they're giving obinutuzumab, they read about the infusion toxicity, mm -hmm. and they, you know, everybody's really nervous about that. And, and you know, and you know, as somebody that sees a lot of patients, I actually, even though the infusion toxicity can be a little bit more, you know, say acute, in some ways that's better. Because because it occurs usually within the first five to ten minutes that you give the antibody, so you sort of know You're when it's going to occur, right. rather than you know rather than it occurring two three hours after starting therapy when you may be someplace else, not there with the patient or close by the, the, with the patient. So really, it, it's actually a, a fairly easy antibody to give because it is predictable. I agree with this. I think that with the experience, it gets easier. Oh. I think we were mm -hmm. among the first uh, in the U.S. to infuse obinutuzumab to a patient and uh, I think the nurses revolted and they said, Dr. Kipps, we're not going to treat any more of your patients unless they're in the hospital. And I had to sit down with everyone and uh, actually coach them on it. I think the key aspect is, uh, as you mentioned, Myron, is the use of glucocorticoids prior to the infusion. We typically give 40 milligrams of methylprednisolone IV, but also it's very important that the infusion be very slow to limit it to less, 100 milligrams or less during the first day. And the nurses pay, play a very important role here because they're right on the patient. They should be attentive to the patient, stop the infusion if we have reactions. And I think the nurses make the difference here. Uh, and basically, I've had patients tell me that it's rituximab with an attitude. <laughs> and what they do is if you tell patients that this is rituximab with an attitude, they anticipate it and actually that helps mitigate some of the problems too. If you get by the first couple of infusions, it's, it's like smooth sailing, and we have very few infusion reactions. So slow grow the first time, but then afterwards, and I agree with uh, Dr. Bird that we do have imp apparently improved efficacy, uh, and that really counts a lot, I think, in terms of outcome. I think it is also just to reemphasize that, you know, besides the split dosing, it is the use of glucocorticoids, which really, I think, make the use of abinutuzumab so makes it tolerable. I think it's important to also remember that though these aren't um, rigorous data, there is a suggestion that there is a very big difference in terms of the risk of infusion reactions using methylprednisolone or dexamethasone as compared to hydrocortisone. And so a lot of physicians who use hydrocortisone need to keep in mind that there is the suggestion that the patients do better using one of the other glucocorticoids. Yeah, I haven't done a control study. But my opinion is that IV methylprednisolone is the best, and it beats dextamethasone because you have greater control over the dose and when it's given. And I prefer it over hydrocortisone because of its potency. So, and uh, we do have some studies ongoing using high-dose methylprednisolone with obinutuzumab, and we're very excited about the, mm -hmm. the data so far, but uh, we have to uh, complete the study. I think th this is great information, but, you know, we're talking about new agents, and we brought up the issue about the ibrutinib. And I think uh, one of the questions and some things that we're seeing now, and I think John has uh, got some information on this, is 
where do we believe that ibrutinib is going to be maybe fitting in, or what is the current use of ibrutinib in the first-line setting in patients, John? Yeah, well, this is, uh, this is obviously something we're all anticipating potentially could happen in the future, and, you know, we're, we're blessed because we've not had a good therapy for 17P CLL which only represents about 5% of, pa of patients at the time, 5 to 10% at the time of initial treatment. And ibrutinib was approved for that group. It's, you know, it's you know, for initial therapy or salvage therapy. And that's probably, you know, where, you know, ibrutinib best should be used, you know, in initial therapy. There's, you know, very promising data from one phase two study showing, you know, very, you know, extended progression-free survival in, in the majority of patients, great majority of patients treated with ibrutinib. But it's probably too early, in my opinion, you know, outside of the 17P group to be using ibrutinib as initial therapy because, you know, as, as ibrutinib is an immunologically modulating drug as well, and anytime you move a drug up to early, earlier therapy, when it affects the immune system, there could be unanticipated events. And I think seeing what the phase three studies show, you know, that are ongoing right now, are gonna be important, you know, to discerning if the, the toxicity of ibrutinib as it moves to the upfront setting, perhaps changes. The other question would be, uh, you're starting, as we said, you have a number of set cycles when we're using combination immunochemotherapy. I think one of the big questions I have is, how long would you continue ibrutinib once you initiate it? I mean, the panel here, do you, do you really continue monotherapy until the time of progression or the patients either say, I don't want any more of this, it's, I've had enough, or do you wait till you plateau, or do we say until there's toxicity? I'm just curious whether...